Building Christ, Building Christ. Building Christ, Building Christ, we want Building Christ. What? Oh, the audience has spoken. They want more Felding Christ. Well, today's your lucky day then, because we've got Jeffrey Schwinghammer on the show. He is, oh yeah, a Felding Christ practitioner and also a filmmaker. He's making a Felding Christ documentary. Woo! Let's get this embodiment, self awareness, return to Homo sapien freedom party started with Jeffrey Schwinghammer. All right, so today we're going to, of course, get into. Feldenkrais, but uh, Feldenkrais is a very action-based kind of education. And so before we get into that, I want to talk about you a little bit. And yeah, this is maybe getting a little, little personal or something, but I think it could be really fun to see what were you like? Like, what was your self-image? Uh, what was your motor movements? What was, how was your voice? How was your, how, what were you like? Before Feldenkrais, like let's go way back to like I don't know whenever uh, junior high school, high school, twenty years old, everything before Feldenkrais, and then I guess after that I might I might ask, oh well, how did how did Feldenkrais change all that? But let's start with the pre Feldenkrais, Jeffrey. Yeah, so you use the the word there, self image, right? And that's a kind of a big word in the Feldenkrais world, and it just refers to kind of your, the totality of you in some sense, how you think of yourself, how do you feel about yourself, how do you sense yourself. And so all that combined leads to particular actions that you take, how you go about the, the actions of your life. And so for me, with my own self-image, like I, I don't know exactly how I came to be this way, but when I was young, um, I had a lot of self-protection patterns where like, and there's a few photos that I can point to where it's like, ooh, you know, he's not smiling as much anymore, right? Like, like I can show you a picture of me as a young kid and I'm smiling and like just this big, bright, you know, smile in my eyes. And then later on, the the photo, like the like it's a middle school photo, you know, kind of like year photo. And like I'm just something changed. Something changed in my experience where I'm not, wasn't so bright. I was so a little self-conscious, like kind of a little bit dour in the face and something had changed. Right. And, and part of that was also this sort of um, depression into my chest. Um, there's some photos you could look at where my head kind of came forward and like, it just kind of felt tight. And with that came a sense of anxiety, the sense of smallness and this, I kind of don't fit in, right? Like whatever emotion I was going through was also manifesting in my body. And, and because I felt it so clearly in my body, like this, this tension, this, it was like, I'm doing something. I don't know how to stop doing it. It was like, because I was so fixated on that aspect of it. That's what really drew me to the Feldenkrais method. When I came across one of his books, awareness through movement. And when he talked about in that book about, you know, how we are shaped by our culture and how movements are connected to everything else. Like that's what really drew me into the work eventually. Um, yeah. So the, the question for me was, you know, what is, I, I could tell I was spinning up my own patterns. Like it was like uh, kind of like these continual slippery slopes where like, Oh, and now I'm anxious. Oh, now I'm tight. Right. And I could sense these internal relationships in myself and yeah, and over the course of many years of sorting things out and going on the zigzag path, and it's kind of that, that's what really drew me to the Feldenkrais method because it most, for me, most clearly t spoke to these different elements of my experience that seemed somewhat disparate, but in internally I knew like they were somehow related. Do you remember your first Feldenkrais lesson and like how you felt afterwards or any any changes that occurred? You know, it was many, many years ago. It was well over a decade ago. Um, I I kind of have a vague recollection of it. Mm -hmm. um, something, I don't know exactly how I stood up after the lesson. But I think the dominant experiences that I felt were two things. One was just like, there's something here. Like, there's something here I'm really curious about. Like, it seemed like something even elusive to my experience. Like, I could feel... If I keep searching, 
maybe something like will reveal itself. And then the other thing was in the one-on-one lessons, I felt safe in a way that I couldn't feel safe with others. And that took me a long time to expand that safety. But like the way that Feldenkrais touch is, is particularly gentle and specific to how they interact with kind of your skeleton, as opposed to like pressing or pushing or forcing muscles. The whole Feldenkrais idea is like to to accommodate the person to in, in hopes that it will help them reduce the compulsivity of their protective patterns. And if you do that, then you can open up some new choices, right? And so I felt probably the most safe I could among all the things. And it took me a long time to kind of learn a greater safety in myself. Um, but that was, I think, really noticeable because I had tried some other things and it just everything felt like uh, they were kind of pushing me to be in a particular image, whereas Feldenkrais seemed like it wanted to be curious about me. Feldenkrais talks about there's these different aspects of our self-image, there's thinking and, and feeling and uh, perceiving mm-hmm. and moving and all these things. But it seems like movement is is the key uh, the sort of the focal point of all of this, or that's sort of the main sort of key that unlocks it all. And what seemed to have unlocked this for you to brought you back to safety, kind of helped you overcome some of your historical patterns from your culture and from your youth and stuff. And um, why, why movement? Like, what is it about movement? Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're right in the sense that you can approach the human person through a lot of different paths, right? through different types of therapy, um, different types of um, exercises or practices, uh, whether it's emotionally or something more cognitively. But then Feldenkrais like, says, well, here, look at movement. Movement can be a helpful way that has a lot of advantages that we should pay attention to when working with a person. So why movement? Well, Movement is concrete. It's tactile, right? If you watch people walk around, you see that they carry themselves in different ways. And that reveals something about how they think about themselves. Yeah? You can kind of tell what's going on inside a person just by looking at them. And when you begin to teach this work, you can see that different students will hear your directions in different ways and then make different movements, right? They'll they'll have a different interpretation and that will refer to a different part of their kind of their musculature, how they enact that. So there's such a multiplicity in how we do any one thing. There's so many types of walks out there, right? Because movement is so... In, integral to life. So back to my story when I was younger, uh, I swam in high school and I also did cross country too. And, you know, that was also during the time when I felt that great depression in my chest, my, uh, I had anxiety at that time. And, you know, I tried to swim and run like the other kids. I, I showed up at the same time every day. I, I I put in what I thought was the effort, but I didn't swim as fast. I didn't run as fast. Yeah. And I think now I can understand why, even though I put in all that effort, I wasn't using that effort efficiently. So the way I hold this habitual tension was having an effect on my ability to, to perform, to do what I thought was valuable at the time. And that is that sense of my self value that's possible there is affected by my ability to move or my own experience in my movement. And so, part of the Feldenkrais method is looking at how can we move more efficiently, more simply, more effectively, more gracefully. And yeah, if I, if I had what I know now back then, I'm sure I would be swimming a lot better back then. That it would, that it would have actually been fun in a way, not a sort of toiling through the workouts. So that, that's the, the dream I would have if I could rewind time a little bit. Yeah, because it seems like the most efficient 
way to move is this really, really easy way to move, almost like the way we naturally would move. But we just like how like, you know, when you're younger and you see the hot chick, you're like, oh, I want to go talk to her and you stop yourself or you want to uh, say something or apply for a job and you're like, no, 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 I can't get it. It seems like we kind of do the yeah. same thing with our movements. We're like, Ugh. we're kind of, it's a re- restraining kind of effort we're doing. We're kind of holding ourselves back. So maybe when you were swimming, you didn't like let yourself, you know, thrust your arms as powerfully as you could, or you didn't allow yourself to just breathe in the way you normally would have. Um, Cause I don't know if this after I did my first felt felt guys last night. I was like, Whoa, I'm a little bit, um, this is easier. Everything's easier. Like, why was I putting myself mm-hmm. through all this pain <laughs> for nothing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, th- those were some great descriptions of like going to the job interview. Oh, maybe I can't. Right. Or, Oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. Right. There's some sort of internal movement. So every time we have a thought like that, or there's a this feeling of I can't, there's a corresponding movement somewhere in your body. Or maybe that's maybe not even the right phrasing. It's not somewhere in your body. It's the totality of you move in a way that says no. Right. And that there you can find and as you go through the Feldenkrais work, you can begin to sense those shifts, right? That like you you said after a lesson, like, oh, how come I was making it so tough for myself before? Like it's easy now. What was I doing, right? So there's we we lack an awareness of our experience, the sp- specifics of our experience. We don't quite realize that there's maybe that sort of internal flinch, right? Like, ooh, I can't right? That just tells me no. Well, what if you're maintaining the shape of that flinch that I can't shape in your body when you're trying things all the time? And you just don't really realize how you're maintaining that that shape of protection. And so that's going to influence how you think and how you feel. And so as you go through this work and you begin to observe these patterns and you can observe how they arise, how they, how they activate inside you, because you can't really stop something that you're not so familiar with. You can't really adjust course if you don't really know what you're doing. And that's why I think Feldenkrais calls it awareness through movement. That's the group class name, is awareness through movement. Yeah, we're talking about movement here, but what he's kind of aiming at more so than movement, right, Like, is, is awareness. What are the choices you're continually making? or the choices you are maintaining in yourself that interfere with what you desire, that interfere with how you pursue your goals, right? If your goal is to go to that interview and you have that internal flinch, well, yeah, there's a thinking component, there's a feeling component, there's a sensing component, and then there's a moving component. And if we don't really explore movement and understand ourselves in in our physical bodies, we're leaving so much on the table in terms of being able to adjust our behavior to make new choices. Yeah, it's like something like much bigger than, like people talk about that Carol Dweck thing, like growth mindset, fixed mindset. But even then, she's only really talking about like, it seems like she's mainly talking about the brain and you could change your brain, but Feldenkrais is like something much larger. You're, uh, you can change all kinds of things that you thought you couldn't change. So one thing I noticed after the lesson specifically was, and you maybe even noticed now, uh, from the last time we talked is my voice got like it changed my voice got it's easier to talk but also it's just like this more uh calming it, it got deeper into my body i wasn't talking before i was talking um just from from my neck upwards really that's like where the voice started and now it's like maybe because that lesson sort of got me into my feet and into my hips and into all these bones that i n- had never really discovered before i felt my whole body then like you felt complete as one organism. And then the voice kind of was just, it's in your toes as much as it's in your, in your mouth and everything. And like, whoa. And it's just easier, easier that way. Cause like, you know, Feldenkrais also talks about how you want to use your, your bigger muscles uh, and even before your muscles eat your skeleton to, to make these large movements. But we're kind of also like using these tiny muscles, like, you know, your bicep or this thing up here when dude, you got this whole body that can, that can take you there. And we're like, no, no, I can do it myself. So I thought, wow, that's cool. <laughs> I, that's super cool. Wow. Like it, it, you can, so you can change all these things like your voice and your, your confidence levels. 
just all kinds of possibilities open up and your whole identity can change. And yeah, that's cool. As an adult, you know, even, you know, you're, you're, you're past those myelination years, but no, you, you're, you can totally change. It's really, really cool. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I, I teach a couple classes at a local senior center where I live. And one of the things I often say to my students is, so we will go through a lesson, we'll do some movements, and then we'll, um, there's always a transition into a rest. Okay, come on to your back. Notice the changes that have emerged or are, are emerging right now. The way you sense one side compared to the other. We use all these contrasts and comparisons to kind of check, okay, well, after doing that, my leg feels longer or uh, I feel flatter into the floor, all these sorts of questions. And what I point out to them is, look, we didn't do that much. Just a few minutes of exploring this with attention, with gentleness, with a, a sense towards the wholeness of our body. And you come onto your back and you have this different experience. And some of you like this different experience. You're more malleable than you think. The way you can experience yourself is way more malleable than you think. And we didn't spend that much time to, to, to make some changes. And then the whole lesson is kind of aiming towards a more global change that kind of pieces all that together. But like, I, how cool is that, right? Like the way you sense yourself isn't fixed. It can change over time. And I think the Feldenkrais method is a way of stewarding that change. To, to be curious, you mentioned the growth mindset. I, I, I would say the Feldenkrais method is the growth mindset, thinking approach embodied. Right here's a practice that takes you through the steps of a growth mindset. Yeah. Oh, you talked about how you had this um, kind of. It sounds like a kind of fear of other people where you didn't trust uh, that you can really be accepted by others and you're, um, you didn't feel safe around them. I'm guessing other, other men your age or even perhaps women, who knows? And I, I felt the same way. I was like, uh, and you know, now you're whatever, you're 30 or 35, however old you are, 25, it doesn't matter. Those patterns, it seems that that self-image you got of where maybe I'm a loser or people are going to hurt me or people are going to bully me. I'm kind of talking about myself now, so I'm not trying to uh, paint a picture of you. Um, you can hold on to that, and all those people are gone. They don't even the new people that you're with today have no idea about that. But you're you're stopping yourself and saying, "No, I'm I'm a loser. Or, oh, don't hurt me." And it's in your in your body too. It's in your voice. It's in your everything. And there's no way to. It seems like really hard to overcome that. But Feldenkrais is like this weird cracking open that somehow brings you back to safety is like whoa thank you thank you <laughs> I, I don't know why feldenkrais is, can so powerfully um bring you back to that place of safety but must go back to the whole awareness thing because you know feldenkrais talks about there's a few sort of states of existence as well we normally we think of wait, waking life we're awake and then we're asleep but he has a third a third level of uh, uh, called awareness and he says in our normal waking life waking life when we're going about our day is usually closer to being asleep than than being aware. And so awareness is actually kind of like the ultimate waking up. And I guess once you wake up and you kind of snap out of that matrix for a second, you can uh, somehow just by seeing it, you can change it. And that's like, what? Just by seeing it, you can change it. Yeah. Yeah. I have to jump in here real quick and share that like I'm not like accomplished in a sort of like perfected, I've healed from everything. I've resolved everything. I'm still very much in my own process long-term of um, sorting out my history. Uh, that, that This does take time. It's not, a, it's not a sort of one and done, although there can be these kind of leaps in terms of, I think what you were describing is you had this lesson and then like that has a continued shift in your experience. And, and you do something frequently. You do this podcasting, right? And so you can track a bit like, okay, you had this lesson and then this shift occurred, right? You can tell the difference in your voice and the way you sit. Um, and it's really a, a long-term exploration because for me, I've kind of been shedding all these <laughs> unhelpful patterns over mm -hmm. a long time that we have these difficult experiences and the, there's a sort of emotional wiring in that we maintain them over time right? That 
they they seep into the unconscious they go into the background of our experience and that means we have no real clue for how we do most things right how often do you try to break down how you walk or any specific move, movement right because most of your habits most of the time are functional enough right they can get you through this thing enough right it might not be the most pleasant way to go through it might not feel the best in how you go through but you're mostly functional right we need our habits because uh human as animals compared to other animals our chief ability is to learn right and other animals kind of learn through their their biological heritage right and we have some of that too but like we can really adapt to any environment we can adapt to the environment that our parents provided us that our school system provided us that the bullies provided us and we all adapted in some way and we might not realize how deeply entrenched those adaptations are and so what is a process that we can revisit how we have adapted to previous environments our parents friends uh, bullies uh, teachers all these things how can we revisit those adaptations and then make new adaptations right because we're always I, i mean more than ever there's new things coming at us every day right in terms of work in terms of political events uh, any anything right there's always something new technology is always coming out there's always going to be something new to adapt to but if we're maintaining adaptations from the past they interfere with our ability to make new choices and so felnicrase is at the highest most abstract level is the thinking process of revisiting playing with tinkering with uh your experience to make new adaptations and then it becomes more specific in movement as the, the primary vehicle to do that um but you know as you as you practice you can generalize that movement practice into more aspects of your life that's not just movement it's how you think too and then you were saying uh, about awareness as a kind of a different way uh or another way of thinking about our i guess our consciousness that most of the time we're kind of asleep and i and i think that relates to like those unconscious adaptations we've had we're kind of acting out what we know most of the time because why because it's super efficient that way i i think i think the the human body has a an assumption that like well let's use what we got because it's cheaper than going to get more information right it, it just biologically it's 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 kind of a bet by the system well we can't keep expending information to learn new things let's just hope the environment doesn't change too much we'll just use the these old ad- adaptations but when we start experiencing friction and suffering from those maladapted adaptations then we go okay maybe we need to change that oh maybe i need to learn something different maybe i need to learn something about boundaries or standing up for myself in relation to bullies or or maybe i need to treat myself with a greater kindness when learning that i don't have to be so hard on myself so all those things all those things we can become attentive to that typically go beneath our awareness and these feldenkrais lessons are one maybe one of the more powerful ways to get into it but i've definitely noticed myself changing over this past year still like you said like i'm i've got decades of work to on this i'm yeah um i'm very neurotic and i talk fast and even the way i'm at, i should be asking you like sort of clear questions but i'm like rambling and I don't know. That's an adaptation I developed, but I, I kind of like it. It's, it's, it's sort of who I am, and yeah. But podcasting, I think podcasting itself is sort of a weird, has a sort of um, similarity to Feldenkrais in a way, because you you do have to gain this awareness of of yourself. One, you're learning something new as an adult. You're you're actually like going through that pain and that uh, of learning uh, something you care about. And but then you got to go listen to yourself talk, and you got to re- edit it, and you got to watch it, and and then you go out and start doing interview podcasts or something, and you start socializing with other people that you admire, or you you want to talk to, you want them to like you, and so kind of 
forces you back into those situations that you never really got over of, you know, talking, talking to these other dudes in high school or whatever and getting along in a safe way. And, uh, I felt like the Feldenkrais lesson definitely helped, but it's also like me watching myself kind of slowly grow, like, Oh, I'm learning and I'm learning. And now I'm actually have the confidence to, uh, to not, I mean, for, at first, I was I was scripting out every episode. I was literally writing it out, and I would just like record it what I wrote because that's because that's you know writing is more comfortable than just speaking impromptu. And then I started to actually just just talk, and um, and then and along that same time, I started to actually reach out to other people and interview people. And uh, I don't know, I haven't if I got better or worse, but it's like that kind of opening up of your self image of like, oh, I'm someone who can talk to somebody and they're not going to not listen to me. They're going to kind of have a fun time. They actually like me or something. And you have a few experiences of that where people are like, oh, I did, that was a great conversation. And that's an awesome dude. And maybe I'm awesome too. Who knows? Or I'm like, not, I'm not a loser at least. And you do it again, do it again. And it's like, even if you don't get the downloads or anything, it's, it's cool. It's just like, whoa, I'm becoming more human. So how did podcasting kind of change you as well? And also, I want to get into filmmaking as well, but let's start with podcasting. Yeah. Oh, I love this question. This is, this is yeah. fun to talk about. Uh, so I started my podcast in either March or April. So earlier this year, and it was a stressful experience getting started. It was <laughs> like, because um, part of my childhood challenges was because uh, my tension patterns had affected my speaking voice. And I always had this real negative downer self image uh, around my speaking voice. But I think even beneath all that sort of tension and discomfort, there was a bit of a dream to communicate, to, to talk about ideas. And because that's what I do with the people I care about is I talk to, to them about all the stuff I love. And I, you know, I had to work through a lot of those um, nervousness anxiety around hearing my own voice uh, to speak and then hear it. And so, yeah, it was definitely a case of, of just giving it a go, kind of feeling the discomfort and then do some practice to re-regulate myself or to calm myself down. Um, I, I, you know, when I started, I still had a lot of uh, kind of a perfection like, oh, I got to get it right. Like, I had, you know, I had all these lists of shoulds of what it should look like because I've listened to so many podcasts. Like, oh, I need this. I need that. I just got to have music and all these things. And, you know, um, one of my coaches was like, well, do you really need all that? You know, can you aim for B plus work? And I was like, B plus work, right? Like, because I had some like, oh, I got to get, I got I got to get an A, right? That's how we do good things, right? That's what I had learned from my s- schooling experience. I got I need to aim for uh 100% on this test, right? Cuz otherwise my future is in jeopardy. I that was instilled in me. And yeah, okay, B+. Plus. I even took a piece of paper out and I wrote down, okay, what would an A+ plus l- podcast look like? What would an A, what would a B+, plus, what would it be? And I and I had to think through, okay. You know, if I communicate these ideas decently well enough. And I have a few ums in there and I don't have any music, uh, but I do have uh, uh, some sort of intro and I do have some sort of way to close it. Hey, that'd be a B plus. Right. And it was a way of thinking around the problem that, or not the problem, but thinking around this approach that I could reframe how I was approaching it. And then like, okay, cool. This, this will work. Right. I don't have to, live up to some expectation that I've, I guess, internalized or that I've, you know, learned in my past. So that was, that was a way of, of learning in the podcast. Uh, I, I love hearing that you said you scripted and have shifted away from scripted to, to more just speaking. I want to go back, but I'm like, no, nah. but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I, I, I've been, uh, I, I was just trying to speak through and just like, okay, I'll, I'll talk and, I have some an outline and I've shifted to writing out a script because then I can kind of think about it for the yeah. whole week and then I can, okay, here are the steps, but I can also sense the edge here, right? Okay. I can get comfortable. This process works. Well, maybe I might switch that eventually. 
And I don't think I would have had that sort of gentleness with myself years ago that like I could, okay, I'm doing it. This like this works. This fits my schedule. This fits my ability right now. I can tell that there's something more eventually, but you know, there's a sense where like that, that fruit will, uh, or that flower will bloom or that fruit will uh, bud and become an, you know, an apple or something like I can, can tell it's a possibility eventually, but not yet. All right. I'm just going to use the system right now. And there's less of an urgency for me to get to the next step. Cause, cause it's almost like, it's not that you grow in one direction. It's almost like this feeling of, okay, I, I'm going to grow in all these directions. And then all of a sudden, like this part will go to the next level. This this thing I'm aiming at. Okay, boom, I'm there. And so it's it's a non-linear sort of growth. Yeah, I think that's like why I started to um do some, at least some non-scripted episodes. Because I I will admit my scripted ones I like better. I thought, no, that's 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 higher quality stuff. That's my that's my A's, that's my A pluses. Um, but it's a lot of work. I would I put so much work into that. It was a big deal. Um but I mean, I can get 80% of the quality or 85% of the quality by just kind of thinking it over, researching, making some little memos, and then just getting into a good healthy state, sleeping the night before, maybe having a little cup of coffee or something, and just just trusting that something is going to come out. And yeah, it won't be an A+, plus, but it, it'll be a B+. Plus and, and then maybe if I keep doing this, the idea is in a year from now, maybe I can just spit out an A+. Plus. But I wouldn't have been able to do that if I wasn't accepting the bees along the way. So, like, yeah, sorry guys, if I get some of my episodes are like, uh, stuff. You, you know, you every once in a while you, you'll get an unsubscribe or something. You're like, oh, <laughs> you know, very rarely, hopefully. But um, that's part of the game. You know, you got to just keep going. <laughs> well, well, here's here's something I've learned is that with those, uh, for me, approaching uh, an episode of like, okay, like when am I finished? I could keep working on this thing forever, but I have committed myself to publishing each week. Okay. So I, I got to get something out. So I can't, I can't wait on it for a long time. And so, okay. If it's at a, like a B plus, Hey, that's pretty dang good. Great. I've published. And then I like it almost, it's just this full stop. It's a period new sentence. Right. And I think the growth comes from really publishing and then learn like learning either directly or, um, explicitly or implicitly like you, you learn through the process and what i find is like my b plus has improved since my first b plus right the b plus still goes up over time but it's a it's it's i i find that having the the restriction of an a plus whatever that fan, fanciful kind of imagination is has been was more restrictive to me than you know just kind of embracing like okay some imperfections People, people deal with that. They like it. Yeah. And it goes back to the Feldenkrais thing of like when you're moving with more ease and not like bracing yourself up, like basically when, when I was like writing, scripting is out and trying to make it an A plus, you're kind of braced up yeah. and your possibilities are kind of limited to like what you're comfortable with and what you're habitually, the ways you habitually write and speak and stuff. But when you just like let it go, it's, 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 it's kind of like that after that Feldenkrais lesson where you just, okay, well, I'm just going to open up and and try to break these old patterns, which is uncomfortable, but uh, that's where the new possibilities start to emerge. Yeah. I'd just like to chip in real quick. So as you were describing that, bracing up and letting it go, you were moving through that. I saw your shoulders kind of come forward, like maybe a shortening in the back of your neck as you were describing bracing up, right? And then you kind of loosened up. And I don't want to call that out for you specifically or anything like that, but you instinctively knew how to communicate that. There was probably some something reminiscent of how you might actually brace up that was coming through in how you communicated about that. It's not good or bad, but like I th- like it's just it's what we kind of already know is that when you're really having a hard time and you're like really you're just you're sitting over hunched over the desk and you're just having a stressful time and like your head's hanging low that movement is reflective of the thinking process, right? And in some ways, it maintains that thinking process of feeling stuck or inability to flow, yeah? 
And so the movement practice is that these brief retreats where you can like, okay, here's a new possibility. Here's a new sense of myself. I'm no longer in whatever I was doing habitually. And then over time, that leads to more creativity. That leads to more intuitive thinking, more associations, because that creativity is stifled by the ways we hold ourselves physically, the way we brace, you know, however we hold ourselves. And then it's going to be different for every person. It's an individual exploration to find out what is it that I do? Because every, everybody has learned a different way to cope with the world. So we need an individual process to understand how I became how I am or how I am based on where I came from. Yeah, this applies to all movements. I mean, for a minute there, it seemed people were like, what's going on? They're, they're podcasting about podcasting. What's going on? But um, yeah, all that stuff we're saying about podcasting and uh, the sitting and the moving, it applies to you know sports and walking and sleeping and uh, communicating, everything really, right? It's everything. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, we we're, were talking about podcasting. Is it is it related to film Christ? No, like you're exactly right. All these activities that we're in, include an element of movement, include our self-image and how, how we go about it. The question is how we do what we do, right? Because you can walk, you can swim, you can ski, you can podcast, you can speak in front of a large audience, and you can do that in so many different ways. The how is where the improvement is. If you understand how you do it and you understand all these other possibilities, in terms of how you can support yourself from the floor, feeling that grounded feeling, how you can um, let your breath be more open, how the expression on your face re relates to all these patterns of either expansion or contraction. You're always doing something. But the question is, how are you doing it? And do you like that? Because if you like it, great, keep doing it. But if there's something you'd like to modify, how can you learn to adjust how you do what you do? And you're also a, a filmmaker. I guess you might have been a filmmaker before all this Feld, Feldenkrais stuff, it sounds like. Um, but And you're making a, a documentary about Feldenkrais right now. We talked about podcasting, and I can share that experience with you, but I I don't have any experience with even really taking pictures. I, I'm not a photographer. I'm not a, a filmmaker or anything like that. But there's a, a kind of a difference between podcasting and, and filmmaking in obvious ways, right? Um, you're observing other people. It's more visual, all of that. Not to kind of overbeat this point, but I think this will highlight other other things that I, I can't see because I'm not a filmmaker. What has um, filmmaking kind of taught you about yourself, and how how has it sort of opened you up, and how have you seen yourself kind of your self image and all that change over over the course of of your, of your filmmaking career, with or without Feldenkrais? But um, yeah, yeah, so. So I'm working on a film right now. It's actually a documentary feature length film on the Feldenkrais method and specifically uh, one student's experience through a number of classes. And so we filmed earlier this year and now we're in the, the long, long, many months of editing it. <laughs> so we're, we're currently there. Um, but like, this is like the first large project I've worked on since going through my Feldenkrais training. So there is quite a contrast between where I am now and where I was years ago. Cause like I actually lost my interest in filmmaking for some time for, you know, I, I did, so I've done, you know, corporate videos. I've done some music videos. I've done some short docs, uh, uh, short films. Like I did that for a number of years in my twenties. And because I had that tension pattern, cause I had that way of kind of twisting myself out of shape you know, from my high school years, that continued to persist. I continue to maintain that. And it actually kind of tightened and worsened because like I was anxious because I was like, what is going on here? Like, what am, what's going on? Like, I, I was anxious because I was anxious, which is a terrible downward spiral, I'll tell you that. And And so I was able to show up to some degree in filmmaking and in, in, in video production but over time, my physical pain and my anxiety totally just interfered with that. My 
my, you know, earlier I talked about a sense of like getting it right or doing a really good job, right? All those are like stifling, right? I actually wasn't able to really edit at the computer at some point where I was like, man, I have to lie down every 30 minutes. This is like really uncomfortable. And, and over time, all that kind of detached me from my interest in storytelling and my interest in filmmaking. I was like, ah, this doesn't, I don't think this fits me. Like, I, I don't want to work at the computer anymore. I don't want this. I don't want to do that. Because I, the how of my experience was pretty, pretty terrible. Like, I had good intentions. I wanted to be better. But my how, like, was really muddled. Um, so working on this project now has been, like, super exciting like like so i work with my producer alice boyd and she's helping us to make this project like it's a, it's a two-person team really but like we've we've gone and filmed in all these different places we we've we she's also a practitioner too in the fallen christ method so we we have this intention of like how can we listen in such a way how can we attend to ourselves and attend to the 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 subjects uh the people we meet the to put this together without forcing it together because there's a sort of checklist mentality or like we need to do this and we have all these shoulds, but we really wanted to approach this filmmaking process from a, a different sort of how. Uh, when we filmed with the subject in March, it was a fascinating, wonderful experience. I've like, I've never been on a project where I felt so supported the whole time in taking creative risks. Because like a documentary is like all risk in some sense. Because you're trying to capture these moments that you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what this person's experience is going to be. You don't know what you're going to find. You kind of have to be in this discovery mode. And I could tell that like you know the way I was trying to think about how do I put this film together in my mind as we're filming it, where. Like, okay, well, we need to get this scene and we need to get this. And if I think in terms of a, a story, she needs to, we need, we need, we need this moment and we need this moment. And it's like, well, I'm trying to put a framework on the subject who is her own person having her own experience. Right. So it's like, and that was stress inducing for me because like, I'm trying to wrangle a cat in some sense. Right. Like I'm trying to, you know, like, like I, 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 the stress from me, I could feel how my own shoulds was creating a stressful experience. And I was able to catch that moment. How I was generating my own stress and like, okay, how can I approach this in a different way? All right. And so, and so one of the things that was like, okay, well, well, maybe we set up a person. We take, take one of our subjects. Uh, we have this environment where they're doing this. And uh, here's a couple of questions or a topic idea. And invariably, we'd take them into that environment, we'd talk to them, we film them, and something new and something interesting would come out of it. Something fun and exciting. Like, it'd be like, oh, I had no idea that was going to happen. I had no idea. And I couldn't have wrote that. I couldn't have planned it. it was, they, they're the experts in some sense. So uh, there's a continual asking of questions and then seeing what the answer is. And then, okay, what's the question to go after that? And that really is, in a sense, the Feldenkrais process in its most abstract way. And how do you meet something that is unknown? And what well, wait, what, how, what, what's unknown? When we, when we talked earlier about like the habits and the adaptations we have from our childhood or from our growing up, in some sense, they're unknown to us, or at least the details are unknown to us. And so there's an unknown within inside us that we can meet. And that becomes the basis for us to practice meeting the unknown in the rest of our lives. Yeah, you're so busy pushing things onto reality. You say, oh, I want it to be this way. I want to make it this way. That you're not even like listening to reality. You're not even listening to the, the people or anything. Right. So even like in this podcast, for example, like I, I feel like I should keep this on topic, exactly on topic and ask, only ask questions and don't talk. It's all these shoulds about how to podcast, for example. Yeah. And I feel like this is actually probably the more than any other ep episode or interview I've done is like where I kind of just letting go of that. And I'm just like trusting that this conversation will go 
in whatever direction it naturally should flow in. Um, and I'm enjoying this. And yeah, maybe we'll get off topic here and there and I'll break some of these shoulds or whatever. But it's a much more enjoyable process and it's easier. I don't have to like crunch up my brain like, uh, remember the question, remember the question. I want to ask this. Uh, I'm just like, okay. You, I'm, and I'm, I am a pretty poor listener. I, I admit that. And that's sort of maybe one thing I like about getting into podcasting is I'm, uh, it's forcing me to over, kind of overcome that. Hopefully I'm, I'm getting maybe 10% better at that. Um, but like in this, uh, interview, especially, I feel like I'm, I'm listening a little bit better than I normally do, but, um, I'm, I'm still not satisfied with that. But then again, that's another should, you should be a better listener. Well, I don't know. I'm I'm trying, I'm just doing what I can. Yeah. It's a sort of grace for yourself, right? A compassion for yourself. All right. This is what I got going on right now. I can hold myself to a high standard and beat myself with it. Or this is all right. This is serviceful serviceable for right now and i'll get a little bit better over time and like it's it's a different way of treating yourself in what you do and it's like a much bigger point i just figured out uh, going back to sort of the self and society and feldenkrais does kind of touch on this but it seems like society itself is sort of this full of shoulds and and, and sort of rigid patterns and saying you you got to be this way and we are so scared to be not be accepted by society or to have our social value drop or any all that kind of stuff not to not have our our societal needs met that we think and we're so focused on that on the shoulds of society that we forget this this individual organism over here that's actually not getting its needs met and it's it's not growing and it's just alienated from itself and so i feel like there's this same everything we talked about with all this stuff podcasting filmmaking uh movements and walking all that stuff there's a exact correlate, it seems, between the actual individual, not this societal modern man thing, but the actual individual, the thing you were when you were born or when you're five years old or eight years old, and then society, which is basically A+. plus. You got to be an A+. plus. You got to should do this. And it it's just like, you're not going to be able to get anything done. You're not going to be able to actually learn or grow when you're so focused on the society stuff. Maybe I'm Maybe I'm bashing, bashing some something that doesn't exist, but that's what that's what I I, I feel. And um, if you can just like kind of let go, you can still live in society, but you can kind of let go of that and sort of let yourself just be. Then it just, it just you live better, and you might actually get better work done. And you might actually somehow still have social value, but even if not, like who cares? Almost. Yeah, like I think I think you're absolutely right. Like society gives us a lot of shoulds right and and it's not always like bad intention yeah. right I, I think it's like a sort of it's good for you right it's good for society if we have these shoulds and 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 of course like, it, like it's instinctive for us to to be concerned about our social value like to con- be concerned about fitting in because not fitting in is like death <laughs> In certain contexts, right? Yeah, we're mammals. We will. We will. We will. If you're no longer in the tribe and you're out by yourself yeah. in the woods, right? Like, like there, there's a. We want to be connected with others, but we all have our our ways of. Well, if we didn't feel like we were connected, what do we do to urgently assure our connection with others, or to ignore that need and say, well, I don't need other people, right? It could play out in different ways for different people. And, and so, well, Feldenkrais talks about there's um, three, three sources of our self-image. So he talks about heritage, which is a sort of biological heritage, which is your genes, your genetic makeup, what you were given just through the ancestry of humans. And then the second one is what you were talking about there about society. That's, you know, society, you're always going to be in an environment that's going to shape you in some way, or you're going to shape yourself in some way in relation to that environment. Yeah, the shoulds, uh, or how, you're, how have you been in, ennobled or enabled by your environment too? They're the piece of, people that have encouraged you and supported you as well. And then the third piece of our self-image comes from our self-education. And of course, our self-education is informed by our education. But basically, the self-education is how we want to direct ourselves going forward. How do we want to steward our own growth and our own 
expansion, our own possibilities. Because like we all are given something genetically. We're all given some sort of environment to grow up in. And to some degree, all the people that we've interacted with have done the best they could given their circumstances, given what they knew, right? And so, well, we then we got to pick up all the pieces ourselves and go, okay, what is it that I'm interested in? And I think this is really central to the Feldenkrais method as a as a learning modality is that it is self-education. What is it that I want for myself? What is it that I would like for myself? How can I learn more about myself in a way that I can tune down what is not so helpful about those previous adaptations? What is, how can I inhibit my um, compulsive need for attention or my compulsive um, attempts to get things right or my my compulsive way of avoiding situations, you know, well, may, you know, it's, it's fine to some degree that like, I'm okay that I have these things. How can I learn to continue to grow? And maybe I can change those pieces over time, right? Maybe I can learn something about how I feel supported internally. I can learn something about the, those moments. What do I do physically that turns me away? Okay. What, what is it about that turning that, okay. You can break it down into pieces and then take those pieces apart, re-put them back together, and then, okay, well, I can build a different response over time. And I can take my past, reformat it, and then use what I like and then put away the parts where I don't like. Put away the the, the sort of resistance or the tension over time. It's a little bit abstract, but I think that gets to in the bigger picture idea. Yeah. Some of these deep ideas get you all. It's like, I kind of, when you wake up in the morning, you're a little bit like your eyes are kind of, huh? you're, you're kind of like, sometimes when you hear people say things um, or you experience something new, you're also like, whoa. <laughs> it's kind of just stuns you. But um, it is kind of a waking up thing, you know, it's like, yeah, you're, you're right. We, society gives us a lot of great things and we are social animals. So we, we have to basically have society at this point. Um, but mm-hmm. like, I think the difference, one thing that you're kind of hinting at there is this difference between just sort of sleepwalking through society and you're actually accumulating, like you have enough connections, you have enough money, you've got, you've got enough, you're good. Like the individual self is, is covered, but in that sort of survival kind of way, but, but he's forgotten about or he's, he's sort of sleepwalking so much. He's not really awake. He doesn't have that awareness so that he kind of forgot about what he actually what he actually wants, what he actually cares about, like that child that he once was. And so I think it's maybe the Feldenkrais lessons also help with this, but also I think just trying new things and uh, engaging in new kinds of movements, allowing ourselves to go in weird directions that kind of sheds this sort of spotlight back onto ourselves and like, Oh, there I am. Hey buddy. Hey buddy. How how are you doing? And you kind of wake up from all that, um, the rat race stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, in one of his books, he talks about the the persona, the the personality, um, that it's kind of a the same idea in different words. We're talking about adaptations. We're talking about habits, self protection. Well, another way to frame that is your persona. You can think of your social mask, uh, the kind of face you have, right? It's also distributed through your body, but you can think of the mask you have, your social mask of, well, this is what the world asks and i will give the world that right uh the boss wants this i give the boss that right like uh, uh people tell me a bad joke and i will laugh so i don't ruin our friendship <laughs> as opposed to like okay hmm. you know i'll have a more real reaction but like it's kind of a joking example but there, there's a way in which we show up in moment to moment that we've put the mask first and not our personal deep down response. And if we have really cultivated this mask and it's rigid over time that we don't even really know what's behind the mask, we, we lose connection with our own internal interests, our internal desires, our, our internal motivations. Because if we're fully in the mask mode of what the world needs or what the world asks of us and we give the world what it wants, we've we lose track of ourselves as as you were saying 
And so for Feldenkrais, uh, he had two two ideas of health. What is what is good health? And one of them is a sort of ability to recover, right? You have some sort of shock in your life. Can you get back up and return to activity, right? Or does that shock take you apart, right? It could be the loss of a loved one. It could be a loss of a job. It could be just tripping and falling. What's your ability to trip gracefully so you can get back up and continue walking? Um, often at times as people age, they lose an ability like this and they can't recover from that sort of shock, right? Falling becomes a high stakes issue for a lot of people. So it's it's a sort of recovery idea is the first level of health. Biologically, your ability to recover, and you can kind of put that across, you know, emotionally, um, physically, and so forth. And then his his other level of health was your ability to pursue your unavowed dreams, right? The the th- and, and he, he framed it. I, I'm trying to remember the phrasing. He said something like, "It was like the pursue the dreams, pursue the sort of dreams you had before you learned to not have dreams, to pursue the sort of dreams you had before you learned." to have that mask, to have this way of protecting yourself that interferes with those types of dreams you had when you were younger. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think that's what he really wants for people. Yeah. He really wants that for people to, to find something that is more internally true to them. There's some things that we, we start doing, we almost like we stumble upon when we're really, really young, like we're five years old or seven years old or something. And we don't know why we like them, but we we do like them. I remember listening to one of your episodes, um, and you might not even know how to answer this question. You're like, "Oh, I forgot about that." But um, you mentioned you like you liked drawing dinosaurs when you were a kid, and I, I I'm guessing now even like if you ima- if you think about dinosaurs, does that give you a kind of sense of like a warm feeling of happiness? Like, do you think you might actually do something with dinosaurs someday? Again, will that ever come back? What, what would you do with them? <laughs> oh, that's such a great question. I love that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, I I, I grew up. I, I love drawing. I love drawing like a few types of things when I was younger. When I was younger, I liked to draw dinosaurs, uh, sharks, and Sonic the Hedgehog. That was, uh, it was like that was it. <laughs> I love the Sonic comic books. Um, like I I don't know if I will embrace din. I mean. Maybe, maybe I'll find some way to incorporate dinosaurs. One thing I love to do is watch the Jurassic Park films with my aunt and my cousin. Like we just love watching those, you know, those dinosaur flicks. I grew up uh, when the first Jurassic Park came out, and so like there is a sort of nostalgia for that. But when in terms of um, what drawing, uh, I, I know people your, won't be show able your to dinosaur see dinosaur drawings. <laughs> I don't have any dinosaur drawings at the moment, but I do have storyboards. <laughs> this is Stegosaurus here. Yeah, that's uh, cute. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> <laughs> this is Terry the pterodactyl. <laughs> well, that's another thing. Now, now, like we're we're treating people like children because they want to draw don- draw dinosaurs. Like, if we didn't like uh, separate like what is acceptable as a child and what's acceptable as an adult, I think we could have a lot more enjoyable lives because we just keep doing the the good stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. What what have we just put on the put in the closet so completely? Like, oh, that's a kid yeah. thing, right? Like, so um, so working on the documentary, I have uh, these storyboards that we use because we want to have some sort of illustrator, animator, and so I'll just show you j- just so you can see what it kind of looks like. Yeah. So that that was a sort of my my sense of drawing coming back again. Oh well, here's something I can do. I, I'm working on this film. Uh, I I. I, I can draw. Okay, well, I need to capture this image so people can understand before we actually get someone to come in and do the actual animation or whatever it is. And so the the skills can come back again or that, that openness to to drawing for me because it was kind of something I kind of put away for some time. Um, but maybe I'll draw some dinosaurs again. Who knows? Yeah, because the, the filmmaking kind of like replaced it a bit right you, you were drawing and then you started filmmaking and then that's when the drawing probably went away right because it's sort of a evolution or a, a sort of a change in direction of a, a similar kind of thing yeah 
Yeah, the, well, there's this great book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. And I think you'd totally be into this. And it's it's a parallel with the Feldenkrais method in some sense. But in that book, one of the things she describes is that you can tell when a person as a child stopped drawing because there's kind of these stages of how kids approach drawing in terms of like shapes, uh, like the specific specificity of how they draw, what details they add in, the, the relationships, that you can actually kind of estimate at what age they stop drawing. And, and most people just stop drawing, they kind of give it up and they 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 okay it's not for me it's not good it doesn't meet my own internal a plus standard so i might as well not do it and so they put drawing aside and you can actually go back and continue learning to draw you can and you can find that you can draw a lot better than you ever did and it's not that difficult right you just kind of need to know some skills and, and and a way of thinking and a way of looking a way of seeing and like a lot more can unfold um and so, but like uh, something I wanted to mention about drawing dinosaurs, maybe, maybe it's not something I do often, but when I have kids, like you, you're going to, you better bet I'm going to draw dinosaurs with my kids. Right? <laughs> like, like, I'm, like, it's not something I'll have in the closet. Like I'll be right there with them to bring my own inner child and joy and playfulness to be yeah. playful with them. I want to ask like some really, um, we've been getting really philosophical and and deep and this has been fun, but I want to ask some of these like kind of practical things I have some questions about. Yeah, we, we said that we, I'm going to ask some sort of should questions because I, I want, I, it seems like there's a way we should sit and a way we should walk and a way we should sleep or maybe there's more ideal ways to do it. And maybe I'm wrong, but you might say, no, just, just walk how you walk and sit how you sit. Okay, that's fine. That's an answer. But First is walking. Um, what are some kind of problem ways that we walk and how how can we improve our walking? Uh, before you answer too, I have like one sort of uh, note from after my Feldenkrais lesson. Dude, that one, that one lesson really opened me up in a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a Feldenkrais lesson, but then I started swimming afterwards actually. So I think it's a combination of swimming that was sort of sparked by the Feldenkrais and then plus the Feldenkrais. But I, I noticed that before I was walking with my legs and my feet and I thought it was just like a, a feet, the feet and the legs walk and maybe the arms swing, but now I can, I can feel my hips kind of moving and I can notice that my chest is moving and that my head is turning and my eyes are moving. Uh, it's a full body thing, which might be your answer, but yeah, how, how, how can we walk and how, what are some problems um, that are common with walking? Yeah. So problems that are common with walking. Uh, I mean, like well first off what sort of shoes do you wear because your shoes have a certain shape to them that will continually give you the same bias in shape in your foot your foot is capable like your hands to move in all these different ways and what sort of cast are you putting your feet into continually um and the similar thing is uh the the pavement is also a form of a cast or like a continual similar shape uh, the the firm floors that we have that are flat, right? To what degree are you going out and being barefoot on irregular terrain, right? The, so we can continue to maintain shapes because our our world maintains the shape for us too. So, however, so what, okay. So when I was talking about uh, you know my my smallness in my chest and my shoulders, all that's going on in my upper body, the way my head is in relation to to my pelvis, to my legs, all that is affecting my balance, which is affecting what part of my feet do I walk over? Um, how do I make the stride from the heel to the toe? Where do I source the movement from? And the trouble is that if you do the same thing over and over and over again, you will apply wear and tear to your body in a particular way, continually, right? So that's kind of the issue is like, like, uh, oh, my knee's beginning to hurt. Well, maybe it's something in the way in which your knee is kind of going too far to the outside. Or your knee is not over your foot in a particular way that just strictly st- structural support, like the bone isn't actually supporting you, right? That Because I, I can hold up this, this uh, pencil here, right? 
And you can understand if I put weight through this, it goes into the ground, right? If I just press on the top, it vertically presses straight into the earth, right? But to the degree that if it tips over, the pressure goes down at a different angle than through the, the this pencil, right? And so there's all these ways in which the forces don't clearly go through us. And then our muscles have to make up for it. Our ligaments have to make up for it. And that's where the wear and tear comes from. The more, more clearly we have skeletal support, the less wear and tear we have. And so... So the more we use our skeleton the, and less we rely on our muscles, the more our movements will like be good for us, I guess? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The more we rely on our skeleton to bear our weight. Right? So um, those adaptations that we or habits that we've learned of self-protection can actually pull us in a way that our set, our our weight goes past our center of gravity pulls us to a different direction right and then we have to use this other compensation to keep us from falling and so over time that leads to a rigidity in our body of just keeping us from falling yeah right cuz our cuz our skeleton is it doesn't really tense up or it just flows with gravity, right? Basically, and our muscles are the ones that are, are sort of moving us and uh, against the current, against the gravitational current or something. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of an image here. So, I mean, this this is kind of like I'm trying to point to something that is already intuitive. That let's say you're you're, you're building a house or you're building the, the the framework of the house, or maybe it's just something at a smaller level. You're doing it with. Um, uh, toys or something, right? And or like Jenga, right? Like you can structure in sub, such a way that it is sturdy from top to bottom, but if you have some of those upright supports at angles in a particular way, the it compromises the structure, right? And so, what is a way that your skeleton can be lined up that your structure isn't compromised? And and, and that's not like a perfect stand up straight. It's it's actually throughout all the movements, right? I'm not, I'm not creating a should here, but to the degree that the bones don't support us structurally, we have to make up for that with mus- muscular effort. So how do we, so the Feldenkrais crisis is like, okay, how do we learn to find um, greater and greater structural support? Because like when you get up and you feel that you um, can move easier, that you're more opened up, I'm willing to bet that your skeleton was more aligned in a way that was bearing your weight. That you didn't have to use your musculature so much, right? And, and it's not something that you consciously, like, I, like it's, it's a feeling, it's a sensation, it's a, it's a way you kind of internally sense yourself. It's not an abstract idea. It's just like, oh, I'm, I'm like, I, I feel more open. I feel more uh, taller or, you know, whatever it is. That sensation is what you're trying to cult- cultivate in this work. Not a, you should stand with your pelvis at this angle, uh, your shoulders back this far, your head like this, you know, your chin forward, or, you know, whatever the thing is. Like that's kind of a top down should model. Here is in Feldenkrais, we go, okay, explore these movements, find these relationships, try this, try that, and then begin to piece together this sensation, this internal experience of like, Oh, that's what openness feels like. Oh, that's what being taller feels like. Or that's, oh, that's how my leg can move in this way in relation to my pelvis, in relation to my ribs. Yeah, it's it's finding the internal sensation. So just walking and like letting yourself be silly and just just let yourself move however feels right and uh, not worrying about how you're looking and getting that A plus walk or whatever. And then that might kind of just open up to be like, oh, yeah, you're, you're like, you're moving and you're, you're, moving in a little different way or maybe you're moving more you're more alive perhaps even but you might look a little silly you're not you know uh like little nutcracker walking down the street but uh i maybe as easy as that you're just you're just letting yourself go uh there's a little bit of a modification i like to make like because i agree like like there's an element of what you're saying is like that's right like the ability to move in any way you like and be kind of silly to have that as an option that's a great like, yes, I want everyone to find that option. Yeah. But it's not necessarily like then that's then you're moving well. Okay. There's, there's actually another piece. Like you're, you, you do cultivate a sort of an internal 
expertise in some ideas around what are the levers of your body? What are the relationships in your body that provide that support? So it's not, it's not ultimately do whatever you want, <laughs> but use this information, part, partially technical information that you learn internally in yourself to support you, right? So you're, you're informed by reality. And you discover the stronger, the stronger points and stuff. Like when I was swimming, when I was swimming, for example, I started, yeah. I've only been swimming for a couple of weeks, but um, at first I was swimming because when I see people swim, I see their arms moving. So I figure swimming is with your arms. Mm-hmm. So I was just swimming with my arms and I was getting really tired out. Um, but I think uh, as I went on and on, I, I started to notice that my, my, I started using my back more. Yes. And I started like kind of shifting side to side and I started to actually uh, notice my legs and stuff. And I don't know if I would have been able to notice all that without Feldenkrais and also with a few uh, nice old Japanese men and women to kind of guide me along. Um, very friendly people there at the pool. <laughs> 100%, yes. But uh, it's kind of the same thing, right? You're, you're, you're finding, oh, it's more efficient to move, to use your lats and your back muscles than to just rely on your arms and maybe beyond that, maybe using your pelvis or you're, you learn the, the more efficient, powerful parts, the parts of your skeleton and p- parts of your muscular musculature. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So in learning the specifics of where you can source power from, that informs down the road how you might want to walk, right? Or how you might want to move or might want to swim. It's like, it's not so much about being able to just do anything, right? Because when you actually figure out what is efficient, well, that's going to improve your swimming. Right. And, and so the, we have muscles of different thicknesses throughout our body, right? My, my finger muscle is quite small in terms of its diameter, but that's because it's for this fine tuning movement to my finger, right? Like if I was trying to swim with my finger, like it doesn't have the horsepower for it, right? It just doesn't. And so, okay, how can I connect my finger, all my fingers to my hand, to, to be in relationship to my arm, to my shoulder, to those muscles on the back, to, to eventually the muscles down in my torso, in my um, pelvis area. My, those are the largest muscles we have. So if we move thinking only with our hands, right? This, this can happen to people who write or people who type or people who play piano or, you know, like they can get so into their hands, their fingers and not have the support, the, the power support Uh, that structural skeletal support that I talked about earlier, if they're not sourcing that as a part of that image of the movement, it's going to create a particular wear and tear. And they're not accessing the power that they have more centrally inside themselves. I could probably extrapolate how to do other common actions, given what you said, but uh, it it might be faster and easier if you can just, um, I can can just ask you. Um, Sitting. I, I feel like I definitely am sitting wrong. I can't really pinpoint why I'm sitting wrong, but I can feel like that I'm sitting wrong. It's like, uh, something's off here. What would you say about sitting? Yeah, so generally speaking in the Feldenkrais method, we're interested in how we relate to the earth, to the ground, to the firm surface beneath us. And so sitting is just a different type of surface that we can relate to and learn from. And so in terms of sitting, like, for example, I have my feet. My feet are sometimes like I, I might sometimes put one foot underneath my leg. Sometimes I have my feet kind of I'm up on my uh, tippy toes. Yeah. Um, I'll do little things like that. I'm not like I'm kind of on the edge of my chair right. uh, sometimes. Little things like that. Um, is that is that a, a problem? <laughs> um, so I guess, I guess what I'm trying to dance around here is like, yeah, I could, you know, the the way your foot, your feet meet the floor, the way your sit bones are on the surface, you know, to what degree are you kind of leaning back or leaning forward? There's all these relationships that like I could tell you, here's the shape to take, or here's the ideal in some sense, right? The, the ideal is that your head weight is, you know, over your spine, which has, you know, curves that are not too large or not too small, that they then go into your pelvis, into your sit bones, that your weight is stacked over yourself in that way. So I could tell you that, right? But I think 
the Feldenkrais insight is more than tell you that, let's go through a movement process where you feel what it's like, where you sense what it's like. And, and I think it has to have that exploratory process that, that unless you go through that process, you won't have that internal sense of your experience, that it could be different, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Like that if without that internal experience, all all you have is just another should. Right. And and that's that's the issue with kind of prescriptive, a uh, prescriptive approach to helping someone is that you kind of yeah. give them a should. And and I'm not saying that that's bad, but I, I guess I'm trying to take hold up the Feldenkrais flag of, well, hold on here. Let's like. Let's let's explore this together and see what we find out together, because there's something very unique in what you need, right? That yeah. that you need to actually be in the question yourself with your body. Yeah. So there's something about I noticed like when we were doing all the kind of philosophical side of all this, it 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 totally made sense. But then once you start talking about these practical actions, it's like let's just do the actions, right? Because yeah. every person is going to have their own individual history and body and all these things so it's, it's really hard to say this is exactly how you should do it yeah right yeah yeah so that's kind of what i'm thinking what if we um yeah what if we do go a the, lesson, the lesson and, now? and and often like a, a lesson is structured with a reference movement and we can do something here yeah. with you sitting okay cool that'd be perfect um and then you know we can go through a lesson and see how that affects your experience in sitting yeah is that is that an okay lesson to do uh I don't know what you're yeah. planning on. So yeah, if sitting one would be, that'd be fine. Yeah. Well, uh, I think we'll probably do um, stuff on the floor as well. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll come up with a little bit of a, a plan here and yeah, if we could take a few minutes, uh, take a break and then we can reconvene and we'll, we'll play with movement and, and people can, who are listening can follow along. Next on Brain Shaman. Jeffrey gives me a Feldenkrais lesson. Clearly, that one with Paul just wasn't enough. Let's get back on the floor and see ourselves for what we really are. And in the meantime, check out Jeffrey's podcast, Expand Your Ability, or go to his website, expandyourability.com.